The Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. is proud to present Freedoms, Rights, and Responsibilities, a series of programs supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities' We the People initiative, dedicated to exploring significant themes and events in U.S. history and sharing the lessons with all Americans. Next, we will have the speaker of the hour who will certainly enlighten us and inspire us, provide us with a vision of uh, greater height in terms of the um, DC Compensated Emancipation Act. Um, he will enlighten us on the struggle for freedom, and liberation of our people. The distinguished historian, scholar, lecturer, inspirer, presenter of intellectual and scholarly work on African Americans as it pertains to the history of the District of Columbia, the distinguished Mr. C.R. Gibbs. Dr. Gibbs. My brother. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Good evening. I think it needs to be said at the outset, well, first of all, I, I can't begin until I thank Brother Jamal back there. Uh, he's going to make me look real good this evening. And I, uh, I, I, it was a pleasure getting to know this brother and to know that with brothers and sisters like the ones I've met backstage, I know everything is taken care of very good out front. But I can't go through with the presentation this evening without pointing out that this first slide that you see here is a reminder, particularly to the young folk, that someone may have coaxed or cajoled you or perhaps even forced you to come this evening. But you need to understand that, as you take a look at this first image, that the history of emancipation is not over, that there are people whose memories and minds, whose DNA is connected directly to what happened 144 years ago. It is also meet and just to consider that you don't have a right to sit in your seats and think that's old stuff, that, that, that's history. It has no meaning to me because it's 2006. When what you need to understand first and foremost is that in 1862, our ancestors also had a lack of affordable housing. That in 1862, they were beset by a hostile city government. They were besieged by racism. And so your task, young people, is to complete emancipation. 144 years ago, the process was started, but it's not over. And you don't get the right to sit back and look down or back or in some sort of false solicitude to what happened, so you think, such a long time ago, unless and until huh, the racism is gone, there's decent housing that we love rather than hate one another, that our young men have no longer a reason to kill one another. This lets you know that there's still chains, as every bit as painful, every bit as innovative in 2006 as it was 144 years ago. And finally, you will never understand why we're in the situation we're in with respect to people of African descent and this city until you understand this history. Next slide, Brother Jamal. You need to know, for example, that this is an image of the city 
before it became the nation's capital. In fact, when it was owned by the slave owners that controlled it, you know that D.C. is sandwiched between two slave states, Maryland and Virginia. Slavery was a part, in fact, the linchpin of their economies as it was with the district. Most of these names don't mean anything to you on the map today, but we want to take a look at just two. The first one is down where the river curves along right about here, where we see a man named Notley Young. For in the seven, early 1790s, more than 260 of our enslaved ancestors labored without pay on his plantation. And you go down there every, every weekend if you love fish. Uh, Sister Io might have had a hankering for some Chesapeake blue crabs or uh, 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 Sister Kuma, you know, wanted to get a little something off Captain Jesse White's boat. Well, that land right there is every time you go down to the wharf, you're on that land. You're on that land that was tilled by enslaved Africans, in which fruits and vegetables were grown, in which a fortune was made by not Leon. And so what I ask you to do is to, the next time you're down there, the next time you're facing the Washington Channel, which if you look closely at this map doesn't exist because that's man-made, but that's a story for another time, and you just about to reach in and grab your fish or your crabs and you turn around and look across Main Avenue and you look up the hill and back toward the back of Lafont Plaza. If you look to the left or you look to the right, as far as you can see, that's land owned by Notley Young. And our ancestors made that land what it is. No monument to commemorate their sufferings and their sacrifices. If we go down to just about where the Navy Yard is, just about where the Navy Yard is, what we'll see is the land that was worked for more than 30 years by a man named Jonathan Slater, right where the Navy Yard is. This man had 29 enslaved men, women, and children. He was the largest slave owner on Capitol Hill, right where the Navy Yard land is today. All the marks of slavery, we, we, we have a map that shows that there was a slave dwelling. For those of you that know Southeast fairly well, for those of you that know the Navy Yard fairly well, see, they're not going to teach you this in your history book, that right where the Latrobe Gate is, there was a slave dwelling right there before there was a Navy Yard. That if any of you know where that blue castle is, the old structure that served as the car barn, for the Washington and, and George, Navy Yard and Georgetown rail line, the place that is today home to three African-American charter schools, all of which, by the way, are about to be evicted because they're going to gentrify the building. That was the site before they built that structure of the plantation house for Jonathan Slater. In fact, his daughter and his son-in-law, Mr. William Prout, lived there. So we have this evidence of the slave trade all around us in this hidden history of Washington. Next slide. Before D.C. became D.C., in an area just about where the Verizon Center is today, took place D.C.'s first slave sale. There would be many more. Next slide. At the intersection of 18th and Constitution Avenue Northwest, not far from the monument, a stone's throw from Constitution Hall and a longer stone's throw to the White House, stood the cottage of Davy Burns. This is the cottage of Davy Burns. He was one of the original proprietors whose name was on that, that earlier map I showed you. He made his money growing tobacco and cabbages and potatoes with his enslaved Africans. When it came time to sell the land to the government so that it could be the seat of the nation's capital, he didn't want to do it. He had to almost be forced. But in an amazing display of what we might call affirmative action for white folks, you see, he had hopes for his daughter, Marcia. He wanted Marcia to have a better life than, than he had, and she wound up doing it because his daughter went from living there to living there. The Van Ness Mansion, 
near 18th and Constitution Avenue Northwest, not far from where the Organization of American States is. It was the first major structure in Washington to have hot and cold running water to all the rooms. It was, in fact, on top of such deep and cool underground wine vaults that it is, was rumored at the time that huh, if Lincoln hadn't been killed, the Southerners had kidnapped him, they might have just kept him underneath the Van Ness Mansion. And yet, you have to understand that on all of these manor houses, all of these plantations, black folk outnumbered white folks. They were the workforce. Next slide. Duddington. This is the, uh, after LaFont tore down Daniel Carroll's first plantation house, because it was blocking a vista that he had an idea for in his construction of the city. Daniel Carroll built a second plantation house. And we're lucky to have that bottom photo showing one of the enslaved Africans that worked there. I've even included some of the landscaping plans and, and a city and block square and a description from an old newspaper. So that you will understand that these slave owners, based on the labor of our ancestors, were able to live in splendor on well-situated plantation houses. And you may say, well, Mr. Gibbs, next slide. That's, there's not too much to commend that today. All of that stuff's been torn down. You would be wrong. You see, there's still evidence of slavery and the slave trade in Washington, D.C. today. In the 600 block of D Street Southeast, there is a plantation house. It, a long time ago, was called the Maples because a stand of silver maple trees ringed a portion of the plantation. Oh, it's not called the Maples anymore, but it's still there at 630 D Street Southeast. Some of you have passed it. If you've ever walked out of the Eastern Market Metro Station, walked across the street to the CVS, if you've walked to the Southeast branch of the DC Public Library, you've been within feet of it and perhaps not even known that it was there. A man named William Maine Duncanson built that plantation house in the early 1790s. And he went broke trying to play it too big. But today, we have his plantation house. And inside this plantation house, if you look up at the top, there are the slave quarters. So yes, there's still slave quarters. There's still evidence of slavery right on Capitol Hill, just down the street from that Citadel of Liberty known as the United States Capitol. Part of that hidden history of slavery and enslavement Next slide. You could walk down D Street, and for many years, in fact, until recently, you could look right here and see the slave quarters. I went by there last month. They've changed the look. So if you don't know what you're looking at, oh, it's still there. The slave quarters are still there in what is now called the Friendship House. Friendship House. There may be some irony in there somewhere. But they've bricked all of this up. If you don't know where to look, you'll miss it. And so another part of our history is disappearing. Young folks, what you have to understand is that history is the bedrock on which civilization stands. And yard by yard and brick by brick, our history is disappearing in the nation's capital. Next slide. It's worth noting that our ancestors, as many of you know, helped to build the White House and the Capitol. Now, they didn't start out with the central portion first. They built one wing, as you see here, then built another wing, then built a connecting portico. Next slide. But as this letter points out, there were reasons why this was important, reasons why they chose a large force of free and enslaved African people, not simply just to save money. But if you look at the bottom part of the letter where I've highlighted it, it says the commissioners, and this is a letter in the collection of Thomas Jefferson at the Library of Congress, it says that the Negroes that we have hired this summer, and we find it useful and proper to do so, those we have employed have kept our affairs cool and provided a useful check. Well, what do they mean by kept their affairs cool and provided a useful check? This is another aspect of slavery with which you need to understand. 
Kept our affairs cool, proved a useful check, means that the commissioners, whose task it was to build the Capitol in the White House, chose slave labor for another purpose. To send a message to those obstreperous Irishmen and those antagonistic Germans that if you sought to strike for higher wages, if you organize for better hours, we'll fire every last one of you and replace you all with slaves. So you understand that with free white men working alongside a large number of enslaved Africans and free blacks, there was a clear message. And here we have a ready and apparent reference to that. Playing one class, one race off against another for the benefit of the ruling classes. Didn't work. There were too few opportunities for slave labor at one point, but later on what we'll see is that the demand would grow and grow and the demand would be yet even greater for skilled white labor. So the tricks that the commissioners attempted ultimately failed. Next slide. Slavery was pervasive and, and, and casual. And so if you went to the northwest corner of Third Street between Pennsylvania and Constitution, into what used to be known as the St. Charles Hotel. Before it was torn down, it was known as the New Capitol Hotel. You would see these kinds of, of, of ads and what have you uh, in the hallways of this hotel. And what it says is, is that we have roomy underground cells, brothers and sisters, for the keeping of your Negroes. And should any of them escape from an underground cell under 3rd and Pennsylvania Avenue, full value of the Negro will be reimbursed to the slave owner. When this hotel was torn down in the late 1920s, evidence of those quote unquote roomy underground cells was indeed found. Next slide. In the 1830s, the District of Columbia was called the slave market of America, not because it was the largest, not because it was the most raucous, but because the slave trade in the District of Columbia seemed to go on. It seemed to be so pervasive. There seemed to be no strictures against it. And I can do no better than to give you an, an example of, of one location. It, it's, the top of it is just peeking out, and it's right here. Next slide, Brother Jamal. The Franklin and Armfield Slave Prison, 1315 Duke Street in Old Town. As you can see, there's an outbuilding, a central office, and then buildings and sheds on the other side of this high whitewashed wall. From 1828 to 1861, this place functioned as a slave pen. From the time that Isaac Franklin and John Armfield held it in the 1820s through the 1830s, it was literally a million dollar enterprise. You see, just one of the slave owners, Isaac Franklin, had a 10,000 acre plantation in West Feliciana Parish, Louisiana. Huh, he had pretensions to rise in the social ranks. He tried to get his daughter married to the former law partner of Senator Thomas Hart Benton. And each and every year, between 1,000 and 1,200 men, women, and children, next slide, were sold out of this place. And I want you to understand, I've, I've put some of the ads so that you can see them. And I hope that you will read them as we take a look at, there were the 1315 Duke Street went through several owners. So there was Franklin Armfield, there was Kephart, and then finally, the folks you see up there, Price Birch. There was so much misery, so much blood, so much violence, so much degradation encompassed in these brick walls that it, they still reek of them today. And, and look at these ads, if you will. 
Now, even though that occurred in Louisiana, the important thing that you need to understand is that in slavery, it was not simply our labor that had value, our bodies had value, whether we were working or not. This is the same period of time wherein slaves were sold to Georgetown University by slave owners to pay their tuition. Next slide. The business at Franklin and Armfields got so fast that they had to lease ships and they would bring enslaved black folk from the uh, uh, northern areas of the upper south, land them at the foot of Alexandria and walk or bring them by train, by coffle, up Duke Street and put them inside this place. On sale day, they'd be taken out of 1315 Duke Street, taken down to Market Square in Old Town, Alexandria, and divided as if they were inanimate objects. Families separated. And as you can see from this list, many of them would be put on boats and shipped to the deep south and southwest. But even then, we know that that did not break the spirit of some of our ancestors. One man named Bradley, having been sold to Texas, somehow got back to Alexandria and founded several churches and schools. Next slide. From my own collection, a sale in the 1830s of a young black woman by a man named Bowie. Anybody heard that name before? You might. Know all men by these presents that I, Charles Bowie of Prince George's County in the state of Maryland, at present residing in the city of Washington in the District of Columbia. And he goes on to describe the sale of an 18-year-old black girl. The Bowies had made their money with tobacco and slaves and horses. Plantation House still stands in Prince George's County. Next slide. Anyone know where this building is? This is across the street from and is part of the DC Superior Court complex. This is the old Washington City Hall in Black folk were sold here in the early years of the city. It's perhaps the oldest municipal building in the District of Columbia. The central portion designed by George Hadfield goes back to 1841 when they were still selling black folk right out here. It's kind of ironic that someone decided to put a statue of Lincoln right up here. Next slide. And this building, one of the best known in the city, has its own history of slavery. For those of you who don't know it, this is the Decatur House, right across the street from the White House, just on the other side of Lafayette Square, Lafayette Park. Yeah, that's the same, the man owned this house for a brief period named John Gadsby, the same Gadsby that had the tavern in Alexandria today. Next slide. When I went there because I had gotten a lead on this particular building's involvement in the slave trade, lady wouldn't even talk to me. She refused to discuss it, but it's okay. I was able to get these drawings from Historic American Building Survey and find that what I had been told and what I had read was true. That Gadsby built a wing on the back of his house and it was there that he kept our ancestors. Eyewitnesses of the time say that you could walk down A Street and hear the groans of our ancestors and hear the clank of their chains. The top was Marsh Market at 7th and Pennsylvania Avenue. Oh, it would ultimately be torn down, but what you need to understand is that along with fruits and vegetables, along with livestock and used furniture, our ancestors were sold on what is now the site of the National Archives. I mentioned the term irony to you. Do you understand that there must be some cosmic irony 
If, in fact, the place where the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Bill of Rights is stored and maintained, and yet it is also the site where our ancestors were bought and sold. I believe the parade may pass that same site. We need to take our hats off when it, if we're there when it does. Next slide. And so we know that slave coffles went right by the Capitol, shocking visitors from foreign lands. They, they could not conceal and they could not, their dismay, they could not reconcile how we could talk about liberty and freedom on one hand and be the despot of slaves on the other. Next slide. There was something else going here, brothers and sisters. Something else that you need to know about. Many people that came to D.C. in the years before the Civil War were shocked at the number of mulattoes, is what they called it then, and mixed bloods, half breeds. They could have taken a look at Congress, filled with slave owners, filled with men who violated the bodies of black women. They would have found that that went up into high places. The ninth vice president of the United States openly carried on with his mistress, Julia Chen. I'm referring to Richard Minter Johnson. Oh, I know you've heard that stuff about Jefferson. We can, we can talk about it. There's still people who will disagree, but we cannot disagree about Richard Minter Johnson. And he became so flagrant, so bold, that his two black daughters now here in this cartoon, it's you, what you see is shock on the, on the faces of these other white folks that Johnson has brought the, his daughters up into Washington society, that he's going to show them off. In fact, he gave white, two white men money for, to marry them. Next slide. This man. His name is James Henry Hammond. Some of you that have studied the Civil War will know about James Henry Hammond, but you won't know uh, what, he, what he wrote in his diaries. James Henry Hammond is the man who in 1853 declared, no country may dare make war on cotton. Cotton is king. Some of you might have heard. What you haven't heard of is that Senator Hammond was a sick and twisted man. He liked little girls, y'all. He liked little girls. In January 1839, he paid $900 for a seamstress named Sally. He had a she had a one-year-old daughter. Hammond almost immediately began to have sex with the 18-year-old. But he kept looking at the, the baby. He had to restrain himself. When he could finally no longer restrain himself, he, he, he had waited long enough. So he raped her. He took her when she was 12 years old. And he continued to have sex with the mother and the daughter, from which they both had children. There's a letter that he wrote to his son, which even suggests that he may have turned his son on to their bodies. You think slavery is some joke. Yes, it's a holocaust. Yes, it is the ma'afa, but it is also what another scholar calls the ma'agamisi. They both mean catastrophe. They both mean calamity. The Irish poet Thomas More came to D.C. and was shocked at the licentiousness that he found in high places. He wrote, the weary statesman for repose hath fled from the halls of councils to his Negro's bed where blessed he woos some black slave woman's charms while he dreams of freedom in his slave woman's arms. 
of D.C., the Irish poet Thomas More would go on to say, here but beside the proud Potomac streams, this medley mass of whips and charters, manacles and rights, of slaving blacks and democratic whites. Next slide. This is F Street. about 1817 or so. Looks a lot different, the street looks a lot different today. But you should know that there's going to be something that happens on F Street in December of 1815. Next slide, Brother Jamal. It may seem odd, it may seem unusual, she seems to hang there in air, and yet at a place that some historians have called Miller's Tavern, People walking down the street in December, huddled against the chill, heard a crash and saw a black woman throw herself out of the attic louvers and down to the street. Who was this woman? Uh, what was she doing in that building? Next slide, Brother Jamal. For those of you who really want to see and read what slavery in the district was like from the standpoint of an eyewitness, I commend this book to you. And yes, it's available on the internet. I want to take you to page 42 and 43 because Jesse Torrey, the man that wrote this book, interviewed that woman. This is what he said. In the evening of the 19th of December, 1815, a black woman destined for transportation to Georgia with a coffin was about to start attempted to escape by jumping out of the window of a garret of a three-story brick tavern in F Street about daybreak in the morning, and that in the fall she had her back and both arms broken. He went to see her. He, 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 he had to hear from her himself what had happened. On entering the room, I observed her lying on a bed on the floor and covered with a white woolen blanket on which were several spots of blood from her wounds which I perceived was red. Young folk, you got to understand that there were still people in 1815 didn't believe that black folks had red blood, didn't believe black folks could feel pain, that we could suffer loss, that we could feel regret or taste remorse. Her countenance, though very pale from the shock she had received and dejected with grief, appeared complacent and sympathetic. Both her arms were broken between the elbows and the wrists, and undoubtedly been well set and dressed, but from her restlessness, she had displaced the bones again so that they were perceptibly crooked. And I have since been informed by the mayor of the city, who is a physician and resides not far distant from the place, that he was called to visit her immediately after her fall and found besides her arms being broken that the lower part of her spine was badly shattered. So it was doubtful whether she would ever be capable of walking again if she should survive. And so Tori asked her, why did you do this? She said, they brought me away with two of my children and wouldn't let me see my husband. They, they didn't sell my husband, but I didn't want to go. I, I was so confused and distracted. I didn't know hardly what I was about, but I didn't want to go. She didn't want to be sold. I, I, I jumped out of the window but I'm sorry now that I did it. They have carried off my children with them to Carolina. Tory ends his remarks in this particular scene by saying that I was informed that the slave trader who had purchased her near Bladensburg, she being a legal slave, gave her to the landlord as compensation for taking care of her. And thus her family was dispersed from north to south and herself nearly torn in pieces without the shadow of a hope of ever seeing or hearing from her children again. Next slide. It was dangerous in the district. Even for free black folk, it was dangerous. You could be kidnapped. Next slide. It was dangerous in the district. People could break into your homes and, and take you against your will and sell you into slavery. It was dangerous in the district. Next slide. Also on the internet, you may read for your edification, the story of Solomon Northup. It's called 12 Years a Slave. A black man who came to the district in 1841, 
thought he was going to be hired for a job, was tricked and found himself sold into slavery in Louisiana for 12 years. Next slide. On his first day as a slave, this is what they did to him. His back had never tasted the lash. He, he was a free black man. He didn't know anything, but when he didn't move as fast as they thought he ought to, when he didn't answer to what they now called him, they bent him over a sore horse and beat his back until it bled. And I've taken out of his book the description so that you could read it for yourself. And he noticed that, that, that if he got close to the window, if he pressed his face against that pane of glass and, and looked up, he could see the Capitol building. Luckily for us, this lets us know where he was. He was in a place called Williams Yellow House, about what is now 8th, 7th, and Independence Avenue Southwest. Next slide. I said it was dangerous in the district. I have for you now an excerpt from a diary written by a black man that worked at the Navy Yard. His name was Michael Shiner. Michael Shiner lived in the block bounded by 8th and 9th and D and E Street Southeast. And he, you know, he would walk to the Navy Yard. Those of you that know DC know you can do that. And those of you that are familiar with that part of Capitol Hill know that you don't have to be black. You can be any hue to understand and sympathize with what this excerpt says. That he got up one morning on his way to work, hugged his wife, kissed his children, took his lunch, and worked that day only to return home and find his whole family gone. His whole family gone. They'd broken no laws, sundered no ordinances, and yet they were taken out of their house and taken down to Alexandria, Virginia, to, well, we've already met him, Franklin and Armfield slave pen. But our ancestors always fought back. Whites who were disgusted with the excesses of slavery worked with us in the struggle, and many of them took advantage of the district's unique topography. Next slide. To fashion an underground railroad. Many of us believe that the district was the southern terminus of one leg of the underground railroad. You know, this family is still prominent in the district today, or certainly people with this last name. It's so unusual, we believe that they're probably related. But here you get a chance to see the kind of ad that appeared in the local newspaper when our ancestors attempted to move from slavery to freedom. We're happy to see mentions in there of organization. Remember, the slave owner said that uh, black folk now suffer from a disease. You know, in order to explain why black folk behave the way they did, they, uh, the slaveholders were able to bring up a generation of experts that developed scientific names and scientific nonsense to explain our condition. And so they said that, that the reason black folk ran away is because they suffered from a disease. It was called drapetomania, the disease of wanting to run away. The disease of running away from the Greek word drapeto, to run. In other words, they tried to rob us of agency. No, we didn't do it because we loved freedom and hated slavery. We did it because we were dysfunctional. And there was another disease that, that scientists like Samuel Cartwright and Glidden and Knott came up with. It was called diastesia ethiopica. That's when we didn't want to work. Next slide. Here we have another ad. Young lady named Aggie. And, and notice, see, see, I get excited when I read these, y'all. I know y'all say I need to get out more, but the, the, the thing here is, is that there's several clues that we get excited about. They said we, we, we suffered from a disease, so that means we didn't plan, and yet this sister's planned, y'all. She didn't just walk off the plantation with just what was on her back. She, how many homemade woolen frocks did she bring? Anybody? Can you see it? Okay, she had more than one. 
And what kind of shoes did she leave in? Anybody see it? Of what kind of quality? Oh, yes, indeed. You know, I believe that one of those dresses she took was probably her freedom dress. That when she got to where freedom's rays shined on her, she just decided to put it on like you put on a new skin. And since she knew she was going to have to do some walking, my sister got new shoes of good quality. And she wrapped her hair. Now, now let, let's not get crazy. Uh, I think you see, see, they tried to diminish it. A handkerchief wrapped around her hair. They still don't understand. But we know, although I don't know if none of you look old enough, but back in my day in the 60s, we had sisters that head wrap. Erica Badu's thing ain't new. We called them gay ladies, head wraps. We understood that this was an African tradition, and so we look at this with pride and see that this sister planned her escape. And still with it, in the middle of all of this tumultuousness, wrapped her hair in the African fashion. And understand that there's a, a suggestion that she must have had assistance. Young folk, you know, you should never say that black people don't stick together. Our history tells us otherwise whether it's the Underground Railroad or the Civil Rights Movement. Or oh, we've occasionally lost our way, but don't say that. It's not historically valid. Don't say that in front of your children. That's a lie that we need to stamp out and drive a stake through the heart of. We need to call forth our best, not our worst, and particularly in front of our children for our posterity's sake. Next slide. We know that black folk were streaming along the wharf, using that as part of the Underground Railroad. Next slide. That the central point of planning was often the churches. This is the St. Augustine's Catholic Church. Do you know that this building stood at 1150 15th Street Northwest? What's there today? The Washington Post. Luckily, they at least have this site marked. But until 1947, that black church stood right where the Washington Post is today. Next slide. This particular minister, we believe, was important in the Underground Railroad, and his church was equally important. Next slide. The 19th Street Baptist Church. This is its original location, y'all, in Foggy Bottom, before they became the 19th Street Baptist Church on 16th Street. Next slide. And of course, the largest mass escape attempt in the history of the Underground Railroad occurred right here in the district. The Pearl Affair in April of 1848. There's something about those Aprils, y'all. More than 70 black men, women, and children were able to get a vessel, sail down the Chesapeake, and unfortunately, the wind went slack, their sails went soft. But meanwhile, the slave owners from Georgetown had sent out a vessel called the Salem. It was steam powered and they brought them back. Next slide. We had our own local Harriet Tubman, Alethea Browning Tanner. She was responsible for purchasing the freedom of more than a dozen, many of her family members. But imagine one woman with only the proceeds from a vegetable garden. President Thomas Jefferson may have been one of her clients. She hoarded money with a view toward freedom. In other words, the world wasn't just the weight of her own shoulders. She believed in doing something for things and for people other than herself. Next slide. And of course, we have this marvelous, again, available on the internet for those of you who want to read firsthand. Written by a black woman named Elizabeth Keckley, dressmaker to Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of President Abraham Lincoln, close friend and confidant. There have recently been a couple of books on the relationship between Elizabeth Keckley, who was born, matter of fact, Elizabeth Keckley and Mary Todd Lincoln were both born the same year, 1818. One went on to become the president's wife who loved to dress in fine garments. Elizabeth Keckley went on to be a noted seamstress who loved to make fine garments and wear them herself. And so she wrote a book about her experiences in Civil War era Washington. And she had had a hard life herself, born a slave in Dinwiddie County, Virginia, 
She rose through her skill with a needle and thread, bought the freedom for herself and her son. It would break her heart that her son, who would enlist in a white regiment, so fair-skinned he could pass for white, was killed in the first year of the war. But her friendship with Mary Todd Lincoln helped to, and her activity in the community, she helped to found the Contraband Relief Society. Huh. People, she went to the 15th Street Presbyterian Church. Some people said that there were two reasons to go to the 15th Street Presbyterian Church. One was to hear their fantastic choir. The other one was to see what new fine garment Elizabeth Kettley was going to fall out in on the next Sunday. Next slide. She died across the street from Howard University in 1907 on Euclid Street. Well, in the 1850s, slave trading was finally ended in the district. Slave trading, but not slave owning. And so even here, we have evidence of slave selling going on in the district, even after the Compromise of 1850. Next slide. Now, the looming disaster known as the Civil War is splitting the country in two. The country is assuming two stark sides, one that supports slavery and the other one that reluctantly is forced, as an author said recently, into glory. Next slide. And so with the guns of Fort Sumter, the District of Columbia embarks on a new phase. Next slide. The city becomes an armed camp surrounded by more than 60 forts. African Americans dig the revetments and fortifications for several of these forts. The city becomes an armed camp. Next slide. This is part of Lincoln Park on Capitol Hill. It is the site of the Lincoln Hospital. Next slide. Black men, although the Army won't take them, beginning in September 1861, I've identified more than 400 natives of the District of Columbia that enlist in the Union Navy, which takes black men before the Union Army does. Next slide. This is part of the mall. And if this is the mall, what structure is this? An unfinished Washington Monument. Doesn't get finished until the 1880s. It is part bivouac area, corral, military weapons, test range, and a variety of other purposes. Next slide. But there are black folk beginning to show up in increasing and alarming numbers in the District of Columbia as the war begins. There's an official statement by the D.C. City Council saying we don't want no more black folk in the district. Some people swear that could be written today. I'm not going to touch that. But we do know that there were also progressive whites who were alarmed at the horrific nature and stories coming out of the district about poor slaves being locked up in jail and, and maltreated. And so they asked for an end to this. So this, I've sort of juxtaposed these so that you can see them. Next slide. And then April 16th, 1862. Emancipation in the district. The tri-weekly Mercury down south is speechless. It runs the story of emancipation in the district and can't seem to editorialize at all. It's stunned because the owners of this paper understand that the death knell of slavery has been rung. If it can be done in the nation's capital, where Lincoln believes he has the authority, it can be done elsewhere in the middle of a war. Next slide. And so here we have the top half of the very legislation that is the D.C. Emancipation Act, April 16th, 1862. Word slavery is not mentioned in there, interestingly enough. It's persons held to a term of service for years, kind of like much of the Constitution where they decided when they originally wrote that document, they would finesse the word slavery and use other terms. Next slide. One unique feature of D.C.'s emancipation was compensation. Compensation. And every slave owner had to write out a description of the black folks that they owned and then to give a projected price. Here we have the sculptor, Clark Mills. Oh, you know Clark Mills' work. If you've ever cursed the traffic on the Washington Circle, you're looking at his work. If you ever got stuck in traffic 
at Lafayette Square across the street from the White House and looked at that statue of Andrew Jackson rearing on a horse, that's his work. And much of his work spangled around town was accomplished with slave labor. And one of the more noted enslaved black men, I've highlighted right there, Philip Reed. Next slide. When Philip Reed finally got his freedom, he was working on a project to replace and put on the Capitol Dome. And when that was completed in December of 1863, he was the only person to figure out how to take the statue apart, reassemble it, and he stood by to make sure it was placed on top of the Capitol. So if you needed a monument that sort of encapsulates DC emancipation, next time you drive by the Capitol, next slide think of Philip Reed. We know he worked on the project. Here's the paperwork. Clark Mills Foundry, where he cast those statues in all of these circles and other places in the district, was just off Bladensburg Road. I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember a club called Metro Breeze. Oh, stop, Jamal. <laughs> or Dino's is where the bus yard is. We think that somewhere about there, that's where my calculations place it, was Clark Mills Foundry, where he used slave labor to cast some of DC's most famous statues. And if any of you know that part of Northeast very well, on the far side of the bus barn, there is a tiny street called Mills Avenue. Next slide. Keep on going. Okay. George Washington Young was the richest largest private slave owner in the District of Columbia. When April 16th, 1862 came along, he owned 69 men, women, and children. His plantation, where he took the Navy Yard Bridge and rode across on the far side of what is now Anacostia and told his folks that they were free and they rejoiced. Next slide. Our good friend Michael Shiner wrote in his diary thanking God Almighty that April 16th, 1862 had come along. That's his part, page from his diary. Next slide. Next slide. There was this wild celebration. Next slide. And there would be celebrations after the war. The D.C. Emancipation celebrations would draw every luminary that you could imagine to the parades and the balls and the church services. Here we have the front page of the legendary Washington newspaper, the, the, the B. Frederick Douglass is speaking. Next slide. James Gregory, professor at Howard. Douglass' uh, event that I just showed you was from 1883. This is the DC Emancipation Parade from 1887. It was the biggest social event among black folk in the city. Next slide. But it would come to an end, squabbling, a lack of consciousness among black people. This is an article I wrote in 1985 for the Washington Post, which described the end of the emancipation parades. Not the end of DC emancipation celebrations, for its beating heart was kept alive in the one place best suited for it, the churches. Next slide. But more black people came to the district. Now that there was freedom in the district, oh, tens of thousands of black folk came. Next slide. And people didn't like it. I draw your attention to this particular uh, publication, which it says the Negro has no soul, and that he is the cause of the war, that he is an animal on the level with the honeybee, the beaver, and the pissmeyer. And a pissmeyer is an ant that spits. Oh, the, the racism was incredible that our ancestors had to face back then. But comes now, after D.C. emancipation in April of 1862, in September of 1862, Lincoln writes the preliminary emancipation proclamation, announcing that come January 1st, there will be a general emancipation proclamation. And here in the camps around D.C., the thousands of people who know that their ancestors are about to see a new dawn of freedom await the rising of the sun the coming of a new year, a new time, an event that changed the history of America. 
made possible, in fact, by something that had happened several months earlier, emancipation in the District of Columbia. So the Emancipation Proclamation is signed. You can time slavery's death now. You can hear it rattle. Next slide. And our ancestors celebrate and thank God first and foremost. Next slide. But of course, in the border states, the Emancipation Proclamation does not effectuate. In the border states, Kentucky and Maryland, slavery still exists. It has to be wiped out by the 13th Amendment. So what do black folk do? I believe you see the word stampede in these newspaper articles. They stampede to Washington. They stampede out of Rockville. They stampede out of Maryland. All the slave owners are amazed. I know myself, I found out recently that the white folks that own my mother's people, I thought they were good slave owners and were shocked, utterly shocked when the Union troops got in the area and my black folks left the plantation. Next slide. The Emancipation Proclamation opens the door to black male enlistment in the Union Army and black men step forward. Next slide. How many of you know about glory, but it's time you knew about the black regiment from the District of Columbia and that this flyer circulated around the streets and boulevards of Washington and Maryland and Virginia and black men came often at great risk to enlist in what would come to be known as the first DC colored infantry. Oh, you don't have to know about the story of glory. No, 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 we have it right here and we have a more unique story as well. These bold, brave rifles, these men that believe that once you get the bullets in your pocket, the U.S. shield on your chest, get a musket in your hands, no power on earth could stop you. Next slide. But it was difficult. D.C. was still sizably southern in its sympathies. And these black men, for their own safety, had to be put on an island in the middle of the Potomac River where they could be trained to become soldiers and fight for the reunification of the country and the end of slavery. Next slide. Many of these recruits would be examined, next slide, by Alexander T. Augustine, one of the handful of African-American surgeons. This black man was the first man of his race to graduate from a Canadian medical college. He couldn't get that kind of education in the States. Oh, sure, he could have stayed in Toronto. You see his business. You see the advertisement. But he believed, much as Dr. King would say, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We believe that he and the thousands like him believe that slavery anywhere was a threat to freedom everywhere. And so he came down. He forsook a lucrative medical practice in Toronto, Canada, and came back to face the hell of segregation and discrimination in the land of his birth and would, in part, examine many of the recruits for the black regiment from the District of Columbia. Command of the regiment, which would come to be known as the first regiment, United States Colored Troops, not because it was the first ever, but because it was the first regiment of black men formally mustered into the United States Army, would be given older, over to a Yankee. Not an abolitionist, but John H. Holman was a fair-minded man who believed in giving you a chance. This angered those slave owners in Maryland. This is a letter from Prince George's County written to Lincoln saying, stop recruiting our black folk. We don't like it. Odin Bowie, who would twice be governor of Maryland, was astounded when 60 of the black men on his plantation walked off and joined the Union Army. Next slide. The recruits gathered at this church, among many other churches, it was on the same corner 144 years ago that it is now, 11th and K. What's the name of this church? Asbury, Asbury yes indeed. Next slide. Many of the recruits in the regiment bore the, not only the psychological scars of slavery, but the physical scars of slavery as well. But they were prepared to risk all in order to choke slavery. Next slide. 
to bring it to death. This is the only picture that we have of the regiment, 1st USCT. Next slide. One of its officers was killed in Norfolk, Virginia, by a white southerner who didn't like the thought of white men drilling black soldiers. Another saw the regiment and was moved by its appearance and believed it would lead to the recruiting of other soldiers as well. Keep going. Next slide. It fought in many great battles, one of which will be reenacted next month down in uh, uh, Fort Pocahontas, Virginia. This is one of those battles where the black troops were outnumbered but fought so valiantly against the Confederate troops who were under the command of the nephew of Robert E. Lee that they deserve a much better known story. It's called the Battle of Wilson's Wharf or the Battle of Fort Pocahontas. Next slide. And it's reenacted each year now. And they would participate in battles around Petersburg in the summer of 1864. The amphibious landings in North Carolina at Wilmington and Fort Fisher. Next slide. They were part of the Union's Anaconda plan to choke off and, and strangle the South, to divide it down the center, to isolate its capital. Next slide. Here we have a praiseworthy statement by General Ulysses S. Grant for the thousands of black troops and the difference that they were making in the war. Next slide. Of course, back here in D.C., there was a battle not too far from here. In the summer of 1864, the Confederates attacked the nation's capital at a place called Fort Stevens. Some of you know it, near Georgia and Piney Branch. There was a black woman named Elizabeth Thomas whose house was destroyed in the battle. Next slide. We even have a map showing the location of the Confederate forces. They were on the grounds of what is now Walter Reed. In fact, they were, there used to be a tree on the grounds of Walter Reed called the Sniper's Tree, where Confederates had climbed up the tree and tried to shoot Lincoln when he came to look at the battle from the ramparts of Fort Stevens. Next slide. But all wasn't drudgery and war. In December of 1864, this extraordinary woman graced the nation's capital and illuminated the black community with her song. Her name was Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield. She was known as the Black Swan. This sister was born about 1817 in Natchez, Mississippi as a slave, but she had a voice that was unbelievable. She became the first black female international singing star, and in doing so, Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield paved the way for Marion Anderson, Leontine Price, Catherine Battle, Denise Graves, and all the singers that jet back and forth across the ocean. This sister had a 27-note range, 27-note range. She could sing soprano. She could sing baritone. Let me put it like this. When Queen Victoria heard what heard Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, this is what she said. She had a most wonderful comp compass of voice, ranging over fully three octaves with fine, clear, high notes. And Black Swan? Oh, yes, she was called the Black Swan. And some of you will recall that in 1921, the first black-owned record label in her honor was called by Harry Pace Black Swan Records. So every time you put in a DVD, every time you listen to the music, you need to go back and remember this sister. That's what they need to make a movie of. Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, who performed in Washington, one of her concerts in December of 1864. Next slide. In the meantime, that final winter of the war, the Army took shelter. Next slide. But freedom was on everybody's heart and everybody's lips. Sojourner Truth worked in D.C., went out to Arlington, to, the, to what is now Arlington National Cemetery, and worked with the freed people in Freedman's Village. Next slide. Many of the soldiers in the regiment after the war would assume positions of leadership, next slide, and command in political and church organizations. And they would proudly, proudly see the 
fruit of their limbs in exercise in voting, which would occur in D.C. before it occurred in any of the surrounding states. Next slide. The right to vote, the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments. Next slide. And more. A new generation of black leadership would come to the district. Next slide. There would be homegrown leadership as well. For those of you who should know that there's at least a school or other institution named after both of these men in the District of Columbia today. The Cooks, brothers, sons of John F. Cook, who had founded 15th Street Presbyterian Church. Next slide. So there. Washington at the end of the war is a redeemed and renewed city. Next slide. And I want to close with one final man. I don't know if any of you know Solomon Brown, but you should. None of you in here was born under such negative circumstances as, as Brown. He was born in 1829. He was born free, but penniless homeless, illiterate. He rose to become a scientist, a lecturer, the first black employee of the Smithsonian Institution. He would be renowned between Baltimore and Washington for giving presentations, for holding study groups that he explained botany and biology. He learned a great deal working in the Smithsonian and where he worked for more than half a century. But he wasn't simply a scientist and lecturer, a, a self-taught man whose letters we still have today. He was elected three times to the territorial legislature. <laughs> he lived at 25, in the 2500 block of Elvin's Road in Anacostia, and he deserves to be much better known. With all of the things that he did, all the renown that he was able to accrue, perhaps the proudest Thing that he had was his poetry. And I want to close with that. One of his poems is called, Dear Friends, What Aroused You? I'm not going to read all of it, so don't be worried. It's dedicated to the Colored Men's National Convention, Washington, D.C., February 3rd, 1890. Written and read by the invitation of the Committee of Arrangements for the Central Bureau of the Relief of the District of Columbia by Solomon G. Brown. Dear friends, what aroused you and brought you from home? Is there any trouble that's caused you to roam from wives and from children, from daily employ? Are all fond home comforts you love to enjoy? Are there dangers that this nation should know? Is the promised protection still coming too slow? You do not seem happy. I feel all's not right, for I see a large body, all colored, none white. You come not as beggars for bread or for meat, nor do you come begging congressional seats nor for any party, but for one common cause, and are seeking for justice that's found in the laws. We come without party, we come without creed, we come as one people to say what we need. We come to this nation as part of the whole, we come as people with minds, heart, and soul. We have not assembled to endorse any man, but to speak to the people throughout this great land, to tell how we suffer and how we are slain, and to ask this great nation to remove every stain. For God's vengeance is creeping, this nation must pay for lives that's been wasted, the crime of today, these dreadful outrages which daily occur and are growing more frequent each month in the year. Is this nation too feeble to care for its sons with full bench of justice, her forts and her guns? Her churches are silent, they don't make appeal. Are there no white Christians? Then why don't they feel? Don't we as one people still worship one Lord? and believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior and God, how can you approach him and feel he is pleased, then murder your brethren and hang them to trees? God's vengeance is creeping. The time's near at hand. His justice, long sleeping, will burst over the land. Such fearful outrages against the black race will curse this nation with darkest disgrace. Yes. Speak out as freemen who have a just cause. Demand true protection. There are plenty of laws. Assemble and send forth an address full and plain. And if this doesn't reach them, 
assemble again. Thank you very much. Thank you.